Okay, so once again, this um, event is being streamed on Facebook and um, it will also be recorded and posted on Craft in America's website and YouTube channel after, after the event. So welcome to everyone who's attending today and welcome and thank you so much to Victor De La Rosa for being the impetus for this project and this event today. Um, so thank you to everybody who's joining us. I see we have a number of um, presenters with us today. Um, we were thrilled to see how um, people responded to the flag share submission um, call and the entries were tremendous and um, very inspiring. So we're looking forward to having everybody share their pieces um, in the second half of this presentation today. But to begin, um, Victor De La Rosa is going to present his work, which has been grounded largely in the concept of the flag um, over, over time. So Vic is an artist who focuses on computer interface technology. He utilizes jacquard power looms, digital, digital fabric printers and laser cutters in his work, along with various other media. And he's exhibited internationally. Vic is a teacher at San Francisco State. He's also taught on the East Coast at RISD, where he is an alum, and at Philadelphia University and UMass Dartmouth. And he received his BA from San Francisco State and his MFA from UC Davis and MFA from RISD. So thank you so much for being here today. And I will turn it over to you, Vic, for your presentation. Um, I do wanna also just say uh, in terms of questions, once Vic finishes presenting, we invite you all to um, pose questions for Vic. Uh, if you could all just either raise your hand or um, type your question into the chat or um, let me know by um, typing into the chat that you have a question for Vic, um, then we will spotlight your, your video so you can pose the questions. So with that, Take it away, Vic. Thank you, Emily. Um, and, and thank you to everybody at, at Craft in America Center because you are so responsive and quick with um, turning my ideas into reality. So I really appreciate that. Um, so I, I'm starting with this uh, flag here, which is attributed to, to Betsy Ross. She sewed this flag around uh, 1783 to 1795. And I wanted it to sort of uh, be part of, a, a, of what we think about as a milestone, a touchstone in, in what I'm gonna be talking about. My, my work is about democracy uh, in, the, in the broadest term, democracy meaning fairness, equality, uh, equal opportunity, equal voices. And, and I know that 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 means so many things to so many uh, people, but really it's about the question of democracy, I, I would say. Uh, and it's also about uh, the inevitability of change and very much about data. So I'm going to, excuse me, um, talk to you about change first. And, and my interest in borders comes from uh, having a parent from Mexico and a parent from Texas and visiting them annually, crossing uh, the border all the time. So in the beginning, I didn't think borders or anything but a bunch of people standing there asking you questions. Uh, but I'm fascinated with this idea of change and how borders changed. This is Hadrian's Wall in England. It was the northern boundary of the Roman Empire in 122 AD. And this was part of the vast empire of the Romans. And this is what it looked like around 117. But now it's, it's fully within the boundaries of the UK um, and England. It's, it's, no longer a boundary for, for the Romans. This border did not stop anybody from crossing it. 
uh, it didn't stop change. Uh, the uh, Great Wall of China has very similar uh, history in that it too was meant to keep people in or out, made of very many parts, many different attempts of control, but now it too is within, uh, completely within the uh, country of China. So if we looked at the Chinese wall, the Great Wall of China, it is um, overlaid onto the United States here. You can see we have about the same amount of issues in terms of the scale of, of that wall. But ours are active at this time and they are also changing. So this is uh, how the United States morphed um, from 1845 to 1853 the arrival of settlers, uh, the expansion of cattle territory, um, the taking of land. And this is, uh, was Mexico at around that time uh, before it started being sold and annexed and, and fought over. So even in our country now, this is the reverse. There used to be a border that was completely within this, a natural border. And now this is a new country border with all of these uh, barriers and walls and propositions uh, to, to manage it. And this water border, the, the river, seems to be holding, but uh, even that is uh, a question. So I find that there's lots of beauty in, in this uh, border. But I also think there's lots of contradictions and lots of uh, unfairness and you know lots of futility. So I visit the border, take pictures myself for, for my own um, art, but also to see how it's changed since I first encountered it. Uh, there's also hilarity <laughs> and futile attempts of, of trying to get over the border. This is a drug smuggler uh, who built ramps uh, and was going to drive over the border, but then uh, got stuck. So this idea of, of our border has always been contentious. Um, you know, this is a, a couple of political cartoons. First, they're being welcomed. Um, and then they're being main call. But it's not just uh, Mexicans or, or Central Americans or South Americans. It just seems to be a prevailing idea in the United States is this uh, vacillating between positions. And this has happened throughout history. So now we're building a border directly on that river that is meant to be a natural border and um, we will see what happens next. So this idea of borders and change led me to a piece that I'm gonna share with you. Um, it's called a study for the 2050 US flag. And I refer to the federal flag code, which is um, United States code title four, which has all the proportions and ways you can display the flag and it's very in-depth. But I wanted to approach this from the idea of what might happen to the United States flag in time as the population changed. Um, one thing I thought was, well, the proportions will stay the same. Some of these regulations will, will be amended there'll be a, a additions to it. There'll be, if you looked at uh, Title IV, you would see that over uh, last century plus, there's always been changes and a lot of them are political changes when, in terms of our, our flag. But I was thinking about this idea, the proposition of changing the flag, creating a new flag, very much like the inception of our flag. Um, was done very informally 
And I was thinking, well, what if somebody just took the materials around them and started to uh, sort of have imminent domain over this idea of the flag? So the flag on the left is based on the 2010 US Census data that predicts when the United States will be non-Hispanic white minority. Um, really sort of a, a shift in the United States. But really, if you looked at it in arc, it's just part of inevitable change. Uh, and then on the right is study for the 2035 California flag, which was the predicted date of uh, the California having a you know, majority in the state. So um, in 2015, Latinos outnumbered non-Hispanics white for the first time in California. Uh, California is a, a harbinger of, uh, national, of the national rise in Latinos. The nation's Latino population has grown 57% since 2000. Uh, Mar Marcelo Suarez Orozco, a professor at UCLA's uh, Graduate School of Education and Information Studies observed where LA goes is where the rest of the state goes and where the rest of the country goes as well. We announce, um, demographically speaking, the future for the rest of the nation. If uh, you know about Los Angeles, it is majority uh, Latino now and it's predicted that, that this is what's going to happen. Uh, in the future to the entire country. But there's a couple of, of um, changes and additions. Now, because of uh, recent studies, they're now predicting that California won't be Latino majority until 2060. But the United States, that figure is not 2050 anymore. That's been advanced to 2045. And all of the reasons people settling down, having children, uh, getting jobs unexpectedly or in a different way are, are parts of this. So I, I look at these things as uh, possibilities. And then I like to interpret this information in some way that speaks to the future, but also to traditions and to uh, prevailing culture. So this is hand crocheted uh, fringe. Uh, part of a sarape is applicated onto digital print fabric. The background of the fabric I, I, I designed as a um, kind of an homage to a lot of the uh, indigenous designs in, in Mexico. And I changed the name uh, to Republica de California. So, this was inspiration for, for the next project, which is uh, a mural of that same concept. It's a 3D mural. There's uh, pieces that move on it. There's uh, a portion, uh, two portions made out of textiles. And I, and I wanted it to really speak to the inspiration of the flag. So really important was this fringe element. I wanted to increase in scale the part of the initial flag. And so instead of using twine, now, now I'm using rope. And it's held together by narrow band of hand weaving. And um, it accumulates. And this is what I was referring to. Uh, this was the inspiration for for taking this larger. So all of this had to be scaled up. And the original for this was from my childhood, I remembered these decorative uh, borders and fringes that were in the marketplace. And, and I wanted those to suddenly uh, have voice. After I got off the loom, it starts to be knotted with friends and lots of snacks. And do not underestimate the power of free snacks is what I've learned. 
And this was the, the finished piece. Uh, it's a close up. So all these components are starting to come together and they are then, uh, I, this is the header that I made by hand. And then the base was digitally printed from uh, my design. And then all the pieces came together here in San Francisco at 24th um, Street and South Van Ness, very active corner a very uh, symbolic corner in many ways for uh, the Mission District here in San Francisco. And this is the Galeria de la Raza digital billboard, which uh, has decades long history of, of public art. And here is uh, a time lapse of the piece being assembled. Um, in terms of importance for me, uh, it's interesting. This billboard has been in circulation for so long, this spot, that this to me was early on in my career was one of my, uh, the milestones that I wanted to achieve was to be able to, to have a piece in this spot. So you could see that there is a hanging element that's moving, a star is blowing in the wind, the header is, is free, and then the knotted fringe is added last. And we finished uh, into the night. So interesting enough, the first thing, nobody touched the other components, the knotted border or, or the header, but the star got stolen right away. And then people uh, started to tag the piece. The first tag happened within a week and I was uh, called because there's a law in San Francisco that you have to respond to any kind of graffiti to remove it uh, within 48 hours. But I felt really conflicted about covering up somebody's tag. So the first fix I did was just doing some more digital print and putting it on there. But that really didn't feel right. So what I did was I just continued my field of stars and made stencils and spray paint and whenever somebody tagged it, I would get a call and I would come down and I would just respond. So it became this call and respond um, for uh, months as the, as the piece was displayed. And then finally I put some vinyl up there sort of to, to address what was going on. And I wanted to have it sound like that uh, American folk song about this land is your land. Um, Okay, so where am I taking future flags of America? Well, now I, I sort of uh, work through other ideas I wanted to work through and I'm, I wanna come back to this and take the latest census, the 2020 census information as it's published and then apply it to the rest of the uh, states that are along the border. Um, and uh, maybe this is where I will respond to either a Trump reelection or a uh, Trump defeat or a Biden win. I'll be sad in a very, very, very small, small way because Donald Trump has been great for my artistic career, my inspiration. Uh, but I push this idea of the nodding further. I really like this idea of the nodding, speaking, uh, sort of a tourist item speaking up uh, for itself. And I also like the process of developing this material and how the materials reacted differently. So I started creating uh, new, new headers and material. This one is yet to be uh, knotted. Some worked better than others. There's a plan for all of them. Uh, this one did get completed, but I just wasn't happy with the way the material reacted. So um, I 
don't think it will ever be shown. And then this one um, came about from a residency in Oaxaca. I wanted to learn how to backstrap weave because one of the things I didn't like about hand weaving on the loom was it wasn't portable. So it really meant if I wanted to do a residency or work abroad, I would have to find a place that had a loom. And then I realized, well, if I start backstrap weaving. So this is really a, a, sort of a 180 from, from uh, what Emily was talking about. And I've gone from computerized jacquard loom all the way back to <laughs> Uh, backstrap weaving, and it was fascinating uh, to learn this. Um, I learned it from a, a, a Mistec woman in Oaxaca. It was from a residency, um, and I am blanking out on the residency, but it will come to me. And I just knew what I wanted. I wanted to make a big piece out of materials that spoke of both countries. And so these are materials that uh, came from a store that specialized in rope and uh, webbing. And so I started there and got hammock material and also material called uh, Hennigan. And I had to make up things as we went along because this was longer than um, usually you're doing when you're learning and uh, my teacher just laughed and laughed as this proceeded. I had to turn the skeins of yarns into balls of yarn without a swift. And so it was, it was really um, great because I was able to really think about the process. It wasn't automated uh, in any way. Here is the start of the loom, uh, excuse me, the backstrap. warp and it's connected to one of the doors where I was staying and I proceeded to weave all this rope, run out of material, had to go buy more several times but was very uh, satisfied with the process. So it, I brought that back and then I started to knot the wording. All of this took much longer than I expected and uh, um, it was an all consuming project. So it involved knotting, hand knotting, wetting the material, see if that would stick, uh, make, you know, set the knots blow dryers, all, all sorts of things. And that was, um, that was the conclusion. And I wanted to end with this piece because it's, it's the piece that's in the exhibition. And it really does speak about what I'm interested in. It, it's this idea of democracy. And this was inspired by, um, uh, Donald Trump and the very first words that he uttered while he was making his, his uh, launching his bid for president. Uh, it was shocking. I didn't think he would get very far. And yet there's a big segment of population that did, wasn't bothered by this. And this has continued for, for four years. But in that moment, as the attack on um, Mexicans in particular started, it, I just really thought of that. If it happens to you, it happens to all. If it happens to one, it happens to all of us. And I really feel that, that uh, in this case, it was very true. Uh, this could be also a stand-in for, for anybody, any belief, background. Um, it was the kind of the attacks that that he then went on to sort of uh, inflict on lots of different populations. So um, that's the genesis of that piece. So it, 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 that's the backstrap 
elements up there holding holding the piece. And um, yeah, so I, I really appreciated this reverse uh, education in terms of, of learning about weaving for me. I went from machine to, to hand and, and that was very satisfying. So that's what I have. Thank you. <laughs> so we're gonna take uh, questions now and Emily will uh, be, if there are any, will be letting me know. I see one hand up from Abigail. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and invite you to speak. Oh, that hand just went down. I do see. <laughs> uh, there we go. All right. OK. Abigail. <laughs> Hi. I'm a, I'm a colleague of Vic's at uh, SF State. Uh, thank you so much, Vic, for um, this fascinating talk. I'm so excited to hear about your work. Um, I have a lot of questions, but one of my central questions is the relationship of your depictions of flags to the actual border space. So you started by talking about borders historically very far back in the past and then relating it to your own experience and to the Mexico-US borders. And as, we, as you demonstrated very clearly, borders are fluid spaces that are completely unlike what the, the I guess the political powers that don't live on the border uh, depict them to be. Um, and they're also fascinating spaces of exchange and that, that are a third space in essence. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm wondering how you relate the fabric of the border to your flags uh, and how you think about the fabric, like the actual lands landscape of the border to your flag works. So I see flags as stand-ins for borders. Um, if you think about it, border walls, Hadrian's wall, it was there. Uh, before a lot of signifiers and, and symbols for um, states were prevalent. Elites had them, armies had them, but everyday people really didn't have them. But as flags grew, they became stand-ins for that. Um, in terms of it's, I think I'm just speaking to the history of flags when I use the textile constantly. Um, but when I use it digitally, I'm also trying to speak of how flags are changing and how we experience flags. I'm also talking about their mobility because I don't know if you notice in San Francisco, you'll see Mexican flags on cars. You will see uh, Filipino flags on car, the Philippines on cars. And, and I, I think that to me, this echoing of that symbol just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that space that you're talking about is just vast. It's, it's just vast. But if you look at the flag, it's a reminder of the borders at this time. But that's also why I wanted to show how our flag was changing because our flag responded to the changes in the country in terms of the number of states that it took on. So it's inevitable that the flag will change. Um, so I also think about it as contentious space um, because as violence becomes more and more policed, symbols become more and more important. And this idea of jingoism and nationalism um, is all expressed mostly now with flags. That's how we broadcast our affinity groups and nationality and pride and all of those things. I don't know if I answered your question. 
Um, I believe we have a hand raised from Jody Freeman. Um, and first, Vic, I just wanted to interject and ask if um, Backstrap uh, will become a part of your practice going forward. Yes. <clears throat> I'm not leaving. <laughs> I can't find it, but I'm doing it in my own way. I I um, bought aluminum tubes in Germany, and that is now. So I'm bringing the machine into backstrap weaving. I want it to look really cool and alien-like. And, and then I would really sort of like to see the natural materials on juxtaposed with that. Um, oh, a second part to, to what um, Abigail was saying in terms of that last piece I, I showed, that was all material made in, in Mexico. The colored part, the green, white, red is hammock material that, that they make for hammocks on the beach. And the hemp material, uh, hemp-like material is called Hennigan, which was an entire industry in the Yucatan. And it was, it was the producer of fiber for the world at one point. It was shipped up to New England and it was manufactured. And there's all sorts of issues of nationality and labor and um, um, What's the other, exploitation involved in that? Um, Jody. Yeah. Um, so, how long did that take you to make? The last one. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a great question. It's really hard to answer because you have to factor in you know, two years of graduate school in one place <laughs> and flying to Mexico and making mistakes. Really hard to say. But to actually make those words by hand, that was about two weeks once it was ready to, for me to start nodding. Okay, and thank lots, you. And lots of snack breaks. Thank you, Vic. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we will move on to our flag share event, but I just want to thank you again. Uh, your work moves so brilliantly to, to the fringe, both metaphorically and physically. And, um, and we appreciate what you uh, offer us through all of your work, which is so powerful. So we will begin the flag share portion of our, of our event today. Um, we have six presenters. We will be starting with Nancy Billings and um, we will go through each presentation and then um, I think we'll do Q and A at the end just to, to manage everything. And so everybody can address questions to an individual artist at that point. Nancy, we invite you to speak first. We're just Thank getting... you so much for having me. I am really honored and thrilled to be there. And I do want to mention that that little girl was my granddaughter. So she's trying to learn. I'm a fiber artist. I've been making art quilts and every other kind of fabric design possible. I was a fashion design major at Pratt many, many moons ago. Uh, I got into the fiber art and away from the fashion. And I started creating art quilts. You can see one behind me. This um, election process that we've been going through for the last four years also got me started making flags, American flags of different kinds. I think you have two um, that you're gonna show. And I have one here that I'm gonna show. Here's one that I'm going to um, show you up close and personal and show you the detail. These are my democracy hanging by a thread 
flags. And I made these without the intention of cutting the end. And I finished three of them for a show at Art Basel in Miami. And as the politics got worse and worse and I couldn't live with it anymore, I said, okay, this is no longer feeling comfortable. And I cut the threads and um, of each one of them because it was really a visceral feeling of how I was feeling about what was going on in our politics. So let me see if I could take you over to, um, if I could turn my computer. I'm gonna to have to do it. Oh, here it is. So here is the piece and I'm gonna get a little closer so you can actually see what, what this is is layers and layers of fabrics stitched together, painted, um, gold leafed, and then left with the threads hanging. And so you can see the detail in the threads and in the gold leaf. And that's what you see when you get up close and personal. And so I don't think you have time for the other one, but I think um, you're going to show another one. Are you putting the other one up? Yes, uh, I can share the second piece that you've given us here on my screen here in just a moment. And all of the submissions that were sent to us will be able to be viewed at the website. And what okay, so I've been doing is using mixed media with buttons and beads and everything else that I can find. Um, and I really like the idea of the knotting and the crocheting. And um, I might just steal a little bit of that from you, Vic. Um, I used to be a knitter. Um, so that's how you see my flags. And um, I'm going to keep going with this because I'm enjoying them. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I'm also going to mention that we have a national um, group here today. So Nancy, I believe you're in Miami. Um, yes. And next we will be hearing from Catherine Chauvin in Denver. Thank you again, Nancy. We'll turn it over to Catherine. Hello, and thank you so much. Um, I've got a script. <laughs> um, I became interested in this project as a 54 year old white woman who teaches art and is deeply concerned for our country at this time. I was compelled to create this piece and the craft um, an America call for flags uh, with Victor De La Rosa came just after I completed this. Um, making artwork during the COVID pandemic, Black Lives Matter and the 2020 election has been difficult, um, but this piece felt like it had to exist in this time. Um, is not uh, typical of my work. Um, and um, a little bit of backstory, my, my father was schizophrenic and I did not know him well. And he died in 2004. Um, he is buried in Riverside Cemetery in California um, due to research and effort on the part of family who felt his service to our nation um, should not be forgotten like many others. And the American flag given to families at a burial is of a different dimension than those usually flown. And they're designed to cover a casket. And this is his flag. Um, my art process is low tech and consists of rubbing graphite onto paper, which lays directly over the flag. And this rubbing of the graphite um, results in raised areas uh, like the embroidered stars becoming darker than the less raised areas. 
and this is almost an inversion um, of areas that are typically bright. So the idea of the stars becoming dark became really interesting for me. Um, this grayscale shift um, replication of an object references gravestone rubbings, um, memorializing the departed through the act of putting their name um, to paper through graphite. And we see examples of this at the Maya Lin um, Monument, the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, DC, where families and friends to this day create their own memorial rubbing to commemorate their lost. And creating something to take away, I love that part, um, to visit a monument and something we can experience as a nation and um, something that people can do to take home. And, and treasure. Um, and so I, I, that that's very meaningful for me. And the metaphor of something as iconic as the flag, the red, white, and blue becoming gray and faded and on paper that is fragile um, is a powerful one for me. And um, I see creating this piece as one of homage and of deep concern for all of us um, as individuals, as citizens, um, and as a republic. And um, thank you so much to Victor and Craft in America for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Catherine. Next we have Sean Connady. I believe Sean, you in Minneapolis. And That's right. I thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Victor, for the amazing, uh, for your amazing work and important work. And thank you, Craft in America. Um, I too prepared a, 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 a script because it's easier for me that way. Um, so this is my snowflake flag and uh, it's, it started as a response to being called a snowflake and as an insult. And I felt the need to reclaim the snowflake. I had just completed a study conducted by non-terrestrial researchers who discovered the Anthropocenic fossil record a thousand years from now. Their report revealed the species suddenly encumbered by the drives which had previously made them so successful as a species in their rise to the apex of the food chain. Drives which can be roughly tra translated as opportunism and predation. Our other drives, though equally powerful, are better suited for coping with human-caused climate change and mass extinction, namely our capacity for empathy, cooperation, and creativity. I approach the snowflake like those future non-terrestrial researchers, lacking the benefit of essential contexts. I explored the structure of snowflakes in 50 different drawings that became the 50 snowflakes of the snowflake flag. The math and geometry of the triad is a fascination to me, and since then I have learned more. Airborne molecules of water and freezing temperatures form around a nucleus of a speck of dust or pollen and create compl a complex hexagonal lattice. Snowflakes assume their shape based on the myriad conditions present in nature at the moment of their formation. Because conditions in nature are never the same, each snowflake has a unique structure, but share many common structural parameters. An individual snowflake may be fragile and fleeting, but snowflakes gathered in mass are a powerful force that can block roads, shut down cities, freeze economies. Additionally, snow is an essential part of our ecology. A blanket of snow protects plants from extreme, extreme temperature fluctuations and keeps them from drying out in the cold, dry air of winter. Snow sequesters moisture, attenuating water flow, until the warmer temperatures of spring melt the snow and replenish our lakes, rivers, and our water table. Recently, models of snow cover have been applied to climate change. The ecology of snow plays a dual role in terms of global temperature regulation. The high albedo of snow cover reduces net radiation and acts as a heat sink, removing energy from the atmosphere in the form of heat. The word snowflake, when used as an epithet, seeks to end discourse while deriding sensitivity, empathy, debate, and dissent. I support 
the expansion of human empathy to include all of creation. In this way, we can survive the challenges we face and defeat those who seek to divide us. Vote. <laughs> Yo. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Next, Donna Dodson. Presenting hers. Hi, Donna. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much for hosting this uh, conversation and this presentation. And thank you, Victor, for sharing your work. It was just breathtaking. I loved watching. I loved your piece and then how you responded um, to the graffiti. I thought that was just brilliant. Um, so I'll just share this. Um, this is actually not a new work. This is kind of from some of my early work. I did a lot of found object assemblage, some with um, like car parts and hubcaps, and then it morphed into doing stuff um, more along the lines of pop art with um, crabs. I live in New England, so I'd go to the beach and collect them, dry them, and then I started painting them. And some were sort of quilt-like, and some were, um, I got interested in the patterns and color, and um, I made like some flags. I did like the Brady Bunch. I did these, um, the McDonald's sign, eyes out. I did, I just got really interested in this um, vocabulary of paint and um, pop imagery. And um, this one is actually based on an early um, Confederate flag where the, I think Victor showed this too, where like the 13 colonies that are in a white, the, there's like 13 white stars and a blue background and they represent the first 13 colonies and then they're red and white stripes. And um, this is kind of cynical. I wouldn't say this is um, uh, like my vision um, of the country I wish to live in. I don't even know what kind of flag I would make that would say that. Um, but this I feel like was more about like lifting the veil, like what's behind this, the good old boy, you know, like, I mean, I, I have relatives in the Midwest, like I, I get this. And so it's sort of like, if you lifted the veil, I feel like there's this, there's this smirking white guy and he's like dividing um, and conquering, you know, white and black American citizens. Um, and that's kind of um, what this flag is specifically about. Um, and that body of work, you know, was was really about, um, for, it addressed a lot, it, it addressed like sit-ins at the Woolworth counter. It, it just kept, I don't know where it came from and then I quit doing it. So, but um, I made tons of these, but um, just wanted to share this as part of this dialogue. I love hearing people's personal reflections on, you know, such a powerful American symbol. So thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. Great to hear from you. Next we have Tom Mann. Hello, Tom. So nice to see you. And for everyone to know, Tom was in a Craft in America episode called Messages. Um, and Tom is in New Orleans. Hello. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, excellent. Um, hey, thanks so much for including me. This is a really, really lovely and unusual uh, opportunity to express an enormous amount of angst that I've been experiencing, like we all have since uh, this whole COVID thing started. And uh, interestingly enough, it's uh, kind of really fits into a whole uh, sequence of pieces I've made throughout my career um, that concern social issues, political issues, you know, um, artistic issues, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, that even goes back to a piece I made in 1994. And here's a, a little picture of this piece. It's a hanging neon sculpture uh, called um, uh, Racism is a Genetic Defect. So when I uh, got the invitation uh, for uh, the making of a piece uh, inspired by uh, Victor's um, lead in this whole deal, I dove in deep because I am right now home alone in the basement shop of my father in the house I grew up in in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where I've been here in residence since the middle of July as the executor of my mother's uh, estate, she's recently deceased. And I've been having a very in-depth 
uh, experience uh, relative to all of these conditions. So on the 4th of July, I actually designed my own flag, which is so parallel to Victor's um, piece uh, that I'm, I'm really kind of um, uh, taken aback and um, happy to know that uh, this kind of vibe is out there in the world. Um, and of course, uh, then I made a piece for the show um, and everyone knows me as a jewelry artist, but in fact, I consider myself a artist working in a variety of mediums, jewelry being just one of them. Sculpture is my principal and most loved medium, but I also paint and draw and um, uh, work in a couple of other uh, little uh, craft techniques as well. But uh, jewelry has been sustaining uh, income delivery mechanism of my entire career. And I am celebrating right now my 50th year as a self-employed artist. So I had a great time thinking about this, quite frankly. And the moment, literally the moment that the opportunity showed up for this, and I went to the website and saw what the dimensions were of the project, I started doodling on an envelope right next to me. And that doodle became this brooch, uh, which I call the flag of disunion. And in almost every uh, piece that I make, um, I either make some kind of a little note that goes, could turn into an artist statement or that helps me think about the energy that went into the piece and how I developed the idea for the piece. And um, sometimes that little notation turns into a full blown artist statements, but at other times it turns into a little poem about the piece, which I'd like to read to you. So the title of this uh, brooch is The Flag of Disunion. And the poem goes like this. Are we on the brink? Is democracy about to drink the elixir of disunion? Are we really this divided? Is this the moment to be decided, a tyrant or a savior? I wave this flag with hopes we find reunion. I wave this flag just once, just now, and hope it's not forever. So thanks again to Craft in America and Victor for your wonderful work. And I really appreciate the opportunity to have um, turned my angst into a physical object, which is what we do as artists. It's what we're here for. And um, I appreciate every moment to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Your words and your work are always incredibly moving. Um, so thank you. Um, next and last, we have uh, Michael Rohde. And then we can open up for some questions, uh, assuming everyone want, would like to stick around. So Michael, thank you for joining us. Um, we're back in California now. We've covered the whole country, so exciting to have everybody in all the different time zones here today. Well, thank you, Emily, and, and thank you, Vic, for, for starting the whole idea. Um, I guess the first thing I should do is, is answer the question, how is this tapestry a flag and what does it signify? Um, if we think about flags as communicative devices, um, then my tapestry, which is part of a series that address how language is used, uh, can fall into that category. Um, this series was developed out of ideas that some of the Peruvian Incan uh, ancient textiles might encode a language which hasn't been deciphered yet. Um, so rather than copy their images and styles, I imagined my own. The basic unit for this language is, a is one of the uh, larger squares, the five by five squares. And there are 160 of them in there. And each of them has only two colors. 
So those each of those units might be letters or words or ideas, um, but in reality, they're random. Um, rather, I think of the symbolism of the colors or the block arrangements as the embedded idea. Um, there are 10 of them that I did in this series over the years, and uh, this is the last one. Uh, the first four were the usual categories of speech, exclamatory, imperative, declarative, interrogative. Um, but over the last few years, the last six expressed ideas about how language is being used in politics and by politicians. Uh, some of these were inflammatory, derogatory, mysterious, and redacted. And all of these images can be found on my website, which is just my first and last name. Um, derogatory used the uh, red, white, and blue of, of the US flag. Uh, the colors were degraded. Uh, the stars were somewhat highlighted and rearranged. But what we're seeing now is the last so far in this series, probably the last I will do. Um, and I wanted the last one to be a little bit more optimistic and looking forward as, as I understood the, the theme of this uh, uh, grouping to be. Um, the arrangement of the lighter colored stars, which are not grays and darker blues, is a rough approximation of the big, little and big dipper. And so the sense is that the little and big dipper combined can lead us to the North Star and be a guiding light for going forward. So it's based on the hope that some illumination will find our way out of the current darkness that we're in now. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you so much, Michael. It's an incredible piece. Um, all of the work that everyone has shared, all the submissions, we were just um, incredibly moved. And so thank you to all of you as artists for, um, for letting us be the beneficiaries of your talent. Um, and clearly there's such a need right now for, um, for people to see your work and to um, grasp onto it and identify with it. and. Um, be moved by all the constructive um, aspects of what you do. Um, questions as we as we close for any particular artist. Um, it's nice to uh, have a chance for everyone to connect through an event like this. Um, does anyone have a question for a particular artist or more for for Vic? And. Question for Nancy. Um, Nancy, uh, why yes. are the pieces segmented? What does that signify? Um, <clears throat> well, I started out as a large traditional quilter and through the years got smaller and smaller because it was too hard to do the big pieces. Um, it just, started happening doing smaller pieces for um, my back actually and the other thing that I had to do was to relearn and to unlearn were the rules because I became a traditional quilter and then I had to unlearn traditional rules and letting go of binding it and letting the threads go and it was really very freeing for me. It was really good. And I'm still working on that. I'm still working on that. Thank you. Yeah, it, what I appreciate about that is that it, it, um, it bolsters what you're talking about. I mean, because we are so segmented right now. Well, one of the things that I've been thinking about while I've been doing this, because I've been doing a lot of work with small and bigger squares is that <clears throat> the fabrics that I'm using, and there are many, many, many fabrics, small, big, they're all stitched together. They're all us. And I feel that it's all the people and the threads are holding us all together. And that's basically how my original piece started called Hanging by a Thread. Mm -hmm. And it's all the theme of the fabrics are the people, the squares are the, maybe the community, 
the bigger squares are the larger community and putting it all together with the threads is the world. And we all have to get along because we're all connected. We can't be cutting off the threads. Otherwise we're cutting ourselves away from each other. So that's kind of where I thought this through. Thank you for the question. Additional questions? Anyone has? Okay. Well, just again, um, want to mention that the Flagshare Virtual Gallery is up on our website. Um, hopefully, you've had a chance to view the link that we shared. And um, please do share with your communities. Um, we, the Democracy 2020 exhibition is also on the uh, website as well, which has um, Victor's piece in that um, and his information about that as well. Um, let's see, if there's no additional questions. I think we will close, but thank you to Victor. Thanks to all of the artists for participating today. It's wonderful to have all of you with us and to feel like our community is is so tightly knit and together even though we're all scattered across the country in our homes so thank you so much thank you